So today we're going to continue our New Year teaching series, DNA. We're looking at Parkwood's DNA, uh, the building blocks of who we are as a church, the values, the values that God birthed in us so many, many years ago. We have just entered our 100th year. We will celebrate that officially in September, and uh, that's an awesome thing. It's an awesome thing. So last week, uh, we looked at the first value. Jesus is our hope. We believe that the resurrected Jesus alone is the only hope of humanity. And the first DNA point is not just vertical, declaring our personal confidence in God as our hope, but it's also horizontal where we are motivated to persistently and with compassion pursue people to help them realize that Jesus Christ is the only hope for all of us. And believing that he alone is that hope, it's led this church for 100 years, not just to love God, but also to love people. And it's caused us to step out beyond ourselves and reach a lost and dying world. But... That was what we talked about, especially last week. This week, we're going to move on to our second DNA point, and it is simply this. The church is our home. Jesus is our hope, and the church is our home. Now, these first two DNA points are so important to us that we put them on our clothes, we make banners and signs for everyone to read, find hope, find home, and so often our prayer is that every person who comes to Parkwood would find hope in Jesus and find a home in his family, and that this would become your home. You see, find home is not just a slogan about this building. It's the heartbeat of all of our people, and there's a reason why, and I think it's important that we understand this this morning, that we need each other now more than ever before. How many will say amen to that? We need it now. Please listen carefully for a moment right now. Our North American culture has moved from being a Christian culture to becoming a post-Christian culture. And it's now becoming an anti-Christian culture. Now, now, let me try and explain what I mean. Those of us who were born in North America in my generation, and you know who you are, you can try to hide it, but we all know. We of my generation in this nation, in North America, in fact, were born into a Christian culture. What I mean by that is there was a widespread belief that Christian values were beneficial to our society in general. But my children and your children were born into a generation that quickly moved on to become what has been labeled a post-Christian culture, which just sort of dismissed what Christian values are. And now this present culture this present culture is swiftly becoming an anti-Christian culture, a culture that believes that Christian values shouldn't be just dismissed. It should be defied because they're harmful to society. One of the emerging messages that we're hearing more and more today is that following the teaching of Jesus leads to hatred, bigotry, and backwards thinking. Now, clearly, that message at its best is an absurd lie, but at its worst is pure hate speech. But it is the narrative that's being pitched and promoted in the media and in secondary schools and universities. In fact, there is a negative and opposing pressure that's being placed on the church and on Christians like none of us have ever seen before. We need each other more than ever. So that begs the question, amen, begs the question, why? Why? Well, because 
We're a family. In fact, we are first a family. Parkwood is not first a humanitarian aid organization, although we certainly believe that God has called us to respond to those who are in need, but we are first a family. We are not a weekly mini Christian conference where you come for an hour and a half, take notes, get motivated, and then go home. No, we are a family. We're not a Christian shopping center where you can come in and consume what you want to consume and then get all your needs met and simply go out and go on your way. No, we are a family. We are a family. And this church is our home. Pastor Danny shared something with me this week, and I share this with you. We want to share it with you. Something about the very beginning of our church that absolutely fascinates us and is very revealing. In the 1950s, a while ago, the leadership at that time thought it would be beneficial to write down how the church started 30 years earlier, way back in 1923. It exists today. That little writing is it's a beautiful, simple, two-page document that recounts the first 30 years of our church. Let me read just even the first sentence from that document. During the early part of 1923, prayer meetings were held in a colored sister's home by a few Pentecostal saints. Wow. Now, now, obviously, the descriptive term, a colored sister, would be unacceptable in a, today, but remember, the letter was written 70 years ago. But what must not be overlooked is that in the 1950s, the writer thought it was so important for future generations, including us, to know That in the beginning of our church, in the beginning of this church, it was whites and blacks coming together to seek the Lord in the midst of severe racial tension. When our world was divided, this church would be united. Hallelujah. So the question, where did the church get this vision. Where did it come from, especially back in the 1920s when almost no churches were multicultural? Why did our founders start this way? Well, to answer that, we want to take you to the record of the very first church ever. That record is found in the book of Acts, the second chapter. The scriptures record in the second chapter of Acts that on the day of Pentecost, Peter stood up and he gave his very first, the very first sermon ever to the church. And we read that on that day, 3,000 people were saved and baptized in one day. So again, raises the question, what kind of church was it? Who were the persons that received Peter's sermon and populated the first church? Well, just before Peter preached that sermon, the Holy Spirit came in power, and Jesus' followers started speaking in languages that were not their own. And in Acts chapter 2, verse beginning in verse 7, there's a record of the response of the people at that service. It says... Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? That, that was a term that described people from, well, they were country bumpkins. They were people that were from the, the lower uncivilized part of the nation. Aren't these all just Galileans? How then is it that each of us hears them in our own language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. By our count, 
there are at least 15 different ethnic groups mentioned in those couple of verses. Yes. They were among those who would say yes to Jesus and be baptized on day one of the church. The writer of the book of Acts was intentionally showing us he wanted future generations to know that the first church family that ever existed was not centered around the color of their skin or their money or their gender or where they were born. The first church family was centered around Jesus Christ alone. It was he that brought them together. That church was a beautifully multicultural church. That's how it all started. Now, I want to give you a second picture. This picture comes from the writings of the disciple and then called the apostle John. He was given a glimpse of heaven, of the future church at the end of time. It's recorded in the book of Revelation, the seventh chapter. The ninth verse. Follow with me as I read it. After this, John says, I looked and there before me was a great multitude. He's talking about people here, not angels. A great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. That's before Jesus. Do you see it, church? Do you see it? John gets access into heaven and he sees this picture of the church and he describes that church as multi-ethnic. They were people from every nation and every tribe and every tongue. So again, simple question. How did he know? How did John know they were from all these different nations and languages and tribes? Well, I think a simple answer would be they must have looked different from one another. Sort of like you do. They must have looked a little different one from another. Now here's, here's a beautiful thought. Now remember, he's looking at the church after the resurrection. Okay? That's the vision he has. So here's a wonderful thought. Think about this. When we die the differences among us will not disappear the hues of our skin and our ethnic distinctives won't all of a sudden just be erased the bible says we will know as we are known we will be magnificently and richly diverse church even through eternity. Oh, I love it. I love it. Now, again, perhaps begs the question, is all of this, that first church and the final church or the church in Revelation, is all of that just an anomaly or a coincidence that's been recorded? The first church, the record of it, and the vision of the complete church at the end? Is it just an anomaly or a coincidence that it's multicultural? No. No. You see, the New Testament letters explicitly taught and teach that the church was to be modeled a, to be a multicultural and multi-ethnic church. Just a simple, quick study that any of you might want to do of the book of Acts. You'll find a pattern of how churches are planted and how they grew. For example, wherever Paul went and when he arrived at that new place, he always would perhaps ask at least these two questions. First question, where's the synagogue? He wanted to know where the Jews hang out. And he would go there and he would preach to them and, and some of them would get saved. And then he had a second question. Oh, well, well, where do the Gentiles hang out? You see, he wanted to go there as well. And he would go there, and he would preach to them as well, and some of them would get saved. But now, Paul had a problem. Paul had a problem here. These two very different groups of people that have been saved and reconciled to Christ, the problem is they just simply don't like one another. 
So what's Paul going to do? Does he create a church on the north side of the town for the Jews and another church for the Gentiles on the south side of the city? Does he create another church for the Romans in the west and another one for the Greeks in the east? No. He calls them to love one another and serve Jesus together. The teaching throughout the New Testament is clear. Let's just look at a couple passages of Scripture. To the churches in the regions of, region of Galatia, to the churches there, it's recorded in Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. Paul writes, there is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or ma free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. To the church in Corinth, Paul would write this, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ to live in harmony with each other. Let there be no divisions in the church, rather be of one mind, united in thought and in purpose. That's the church. To the church in Ephesus, the apostle Paul would write these words, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14. For Christ himself, this is a unique verse. In fact, I'm going to ask the, the, our tech help back there to leave this, screen on the, or this verse on the screen for a few minutes, if you will. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14. For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people, when in his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. Just keep that picture, that verse there for a minute. Parkwood, are you seeing the picture here? Are you seeing the picture? Jesus died to create something that the world had never seen before. He died to create something the world had never been a part of before. He provided a place Jesus provided a place where whoever will come can come. Think about that. Whoever will come can come. No one is set apart. No one is told they're not welcome here. They can come through the work and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus died to create one new people. In this text in Ephesians, Paul says that Jesus on the cross, look at it again, broke down the dividing wall of hostility. This dividing wall of hostility can certainly be a reference to the walls that were in the temple courts at the time. People, the Jews and the Gentiles of that day would have understood exactly what Paul was talking most likely about here. You see, 2,000 years ago, the temple was constructed in such a way that there were multiple courts, beginning with the court that perhaps only the high priest could go into, the, the, that innermost chamber where the high priest only could go. But it was walled off. There was walls there that prevented anyone else. And then beyond that uh, was a place that the regular priests could go. And they could go into that place because they qualified. Beyond that walled court, there was another walled court where only the men could go. And then there was a walled cart court beyond that where the women were permitted. And then there was a wall that created the outer court for the Gentiles, a place for non-Jews. And you were not allowed to pass beyond that wall into the other courts if you were not a pure Jew. In fact... In 1871, archaeologists discovered the remnants of that dividing wall with the words still inscribed on it, warning Gentiles not to go any further for fear of death. So do you see it now? Do you see it now? Paul says the reason why he's so intent on building multi-ethnic, multicultural churches is because when Christ died on the cross... Jesus tore down the wall, the dividing wall of hostility. Now anybody, red, yellow, black, white, has access into his presence. This church is our home. And yet perhaps one of the great tragedies of much of the North American church history is that there have been those who've sought to continue and determined to rebuild the barriers 
that Christ had come to destroy. One might say, does it really matter? Does it really, really matter whether a church is multicultural or multi-ethnic or not? Is this something that you just, you and Pastor Danny have this thing about? Is it just your thing? Well, let me tell you something. It matters. It matters if you're a community that, you, that is multicultural. I know certainly well that there are some communities that there basically are, is only one culture there. Perhaps it's so small and they've not had an influx of those who came from other countries or other areas. Why, how, do you, how do you know? How do you know if your community is multicultural or not? <laughs> Let me offer a suggestion for personal experience. I believe the best place to discover if your community is multicultural is in the emergency room of the mo local hospital. You see, suffering and sickness are no respecters of color, customs, or language. Spend a few hours in that location, and it will reveal to you the cultural distinctives of your community. In fact, I believe if a church is not mirroring the colors and the customs and the languages of the emergency room of the local hospital, then that church is not yet reaching its whole community with the soul-saving, life-changing gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm convinced that one of the most powerful witnesses of God's grace and goodness to an observant world is churches that have become homes for every sector of society. I love it that right now, in this room, look around, in this room, we have so many different cultures represented. We are not called here to be colorblind, as wonderful as that sounds to some people. We're not called here to be colorblind. We're called to be here to be color conscious and to celebrate its variations. I love it that right now, Parkwood, we are poised in position, perhaps more than ever before, to fulfill the mission and the mandate the Lord Jesus gave us to take the gospel to the whole world. And it begins with the whole world that lives in your neighborhood, in mine, where we live and where we work. I love it that right now, we, right now, in this series of messages in our DNA. We are boldly declaring once again and clear, clearly sharing and restating our vision to be a church that is fully committed to the message of the love of Jesus to whoever will receive it. No one left out, no one forgotten. Pastor Danny shared last week, he shared last week that we are prayerfully considering the purchase of a building in the downtown. And who knows how many other decisions we will have to make in whatever years are left yet in the future of this church. But no matter how many locations we might have, no matter on how many properties we may gather, gather Churchwood or Parkwood as a home is something worth celebrating and something worth replicating. Parkwood. Hear me carefully. A church, a church, any church, a church that is Jesus-focused, praising, unified, multicultural, is a church that gives the sweet taste of heaven itself. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah.